Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. Now, we have heard the life of Joseph in many preachings, and we had many preachers and teachers who had taught on the story of the life of Job. Now, this narrative has gone beyond more than a Sunday school children's lesson to a DreamWorks full animated film with catchy music to the theme of many a moving preaching. And indeed, the story of Job of, of Joseph is indeed a moving one, one that is filled with so much drama that it would put so many telenovelas today to shame. It's full of twists and turns, and it has a gut-wrenching twist and a tear-jerking reveal in the end that would leave the reader or the listener at the edge of their seats. But it is something more. Now, we have to remember that the story of the life of Joseph is, is written by Moses, who is a spokesperson for Israel, and he is showing Israel in their dispensation the foundational history of the nation of God. It's a genesis, so to speak. As such, it shows basically the providence of God in his preservation of Israel in keeping with his promises in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, it is showing also the presence of God as he communicated his word, his will, and his way to the patriarchs of Israel as they moved along in their history. Now, if we follow this sense, it would come to no surprise that the life of Joseph begins as it should in Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 to 4. Now, that's the passage we're going to look at tonight. And let us read that passage, Genesis 37, verses 1 to 4. And we would read how the story of the life of Joseph would begin. It says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph, more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. That's where many of the Sunday school stories start, right? Verse 4, And when his brethren saw that his father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Notice that our passage begins with, the Jake, with Jacob, and his generations in Canaan. This is where God had promised to give Abraham the land. Then it begins to focus on Joseph and his relationship with his other brothers, the sons of Israel. Then we come to the beginning of our passage in Genesis chapter 37 verse 5 that says, And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now right there, many would skip over this portion, being uncomfortable to deal with the fact that Joseph dreamed the dream that actually came to pass. And the truth of the matter is, it is no ordinary dream, but rather divine revelation of what will happen in the future and simply focus on the drama and the emotion of Joseph's story. Now, the reason why many are uncomfortable in dealing with dreams as a means for divine revelation is because either on one side, it's overemphasized according to the denominational preference, believing that dreams still exist today and they have meaning. On the other hand, some have the tendency to despise the prophesyings, denying to the bone that God ever revealed His word, His will, and His way in dreams, simply because of a denominational tradition. 
but they cannot explain why dreams were viable as means of revelation then, but not today in this dispensation of grace. Now, both of those are simply a problem of not heeding what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, the truth is, Joseph's dream stated at the start of the narrative is the keystone in which this narrative actually unfolds and culminates. This allows us to see the providence and presence of God from the beginning of Joseph's story up to the very end. Truth is, my friends, Joseph's conclusions in the end of this story did not happen in a vacuum. God communicated something to Joseph that in the end led to his conclusion. And the way that God communicated to Joseph that truth is declared in the start of our passage that says, Joseph dreamed a dream. I believe a good question to ask for our study is, how does God communicate his word then and now? That is the intent of tonight's study, looking at the life of Joseph and seeing dispensational truths. Now, we begin our study with establishing the fact how, of how God has communicated with man in times past. I hope you're ready. Let's start from the very beginning. Let me hold your place at Genesis 37, and let's start from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to verse 17. Now, if you would turn your Bibles there, you would see these words, and it says, and the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So you see there, God communicated his word that expresses his will to man, that is Adam in our passage, directly. God commanded the man saying, and he expressed his words. Now, this is also seen happening in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 to, 30, 9 to 19. Now, here's another way that God communicated in times past. Let's read Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. And the word of God says this, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee, uh, un uh, at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over them, over him. See? We see that in this time, God talked directly to Cain. That's what our passage says. The Lord said unto Cain. Next. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. Uh, so Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, up to verse 14. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, up to verse 14. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 13 to 14, and it says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. See? God communicated his word, his will, and what he wants to do, showing Noah how to build the ark, and that's happened, that happened, directly. You see? It happens directly. God communicated His word, His will, and His way to specific spokespersons directly. Okay. Now, you would observe that the structure of Genesis 
flows going from general to specific. It started in Genesis chapter 1 with creation as a whole, and then it deals with man. With man, it began with Adam, it moved to Seth, to Noah. This time, we go to how God communicated to Abraham. Then, he was called Abraham. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and let me read to you verses 1 to 3. And the word of God says this, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Very directly, we see how God communicated his word, especially his promise and call to Abram, directly. The Lord had said unto Abram. Now, there's more than just direct communication with Abram because he appeared to Abraham by a vision in Genesis 15 verse 1, as a theophany in Genesis chapter 18, and as the angel of the Lord in Genesis chapter 22. Now, here's another pattern that is observable in the book of Genesis. In connection to Abraham, we see connections with other people. This time, if you turn to Genesis chapter 16, verse 7, we would see this. Genesis chapter 16, verse number 7, it says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur, to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. So we see, in connection to Abram, God communicated by the angel of the Lord to Hagar directly. Did you notice? God speaks to man in these times directly. Now later on, we would see that this angel of the Lord would be the angel of God talking to Hagar. Now, let's see again another connection to Abraham. Abraham, let's turn to Genesis chapter 20 and let me read to you verses 3 to 4. Genesis chapter 20 verses 3 to 4 and we see this. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Now, that's the first occurrence of God coming to a person in a dream, and Abimelech is not part of Abraham's seed nor part of the Abrahamic covenant. But in connection to Abraham, that's their strand. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken... For the, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, we see that in connection to Abraham, God dealt with Abimelech directly in a dream. God came in a dream and said directly to the person what he wants to say. Now, this marks the first occurrence of God communicating in a dream. So mind the pattern of the connections, and you will see this manifest later on, especially in the story of Joseph. And maybe if you've known the story before, you're already making the connections. Hagar and Abimelech, God communicated to them in connection with Abraham. Now let's move on. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 26, and let me read to you verses 2 to verse 3. Genesis 26 verses 2 to 3. Now we see the progression of how God communicates and so far God is communicating directly either through a theophany. Now we saw that God communicate with the vision and in a dream. Now, Genesis 26 verse 2 to 3 and we read, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee, tell thee of. 
Sojourn in the land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, for unto thee unto thy, and unto thy seed, for unto thee and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Now who is this he that the Lord appeared unto? Now, we need to just move one verse above, and you'll see that, And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Now, his, this is the he. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. So God appeared to Isaac, directly communicating his word. I hope that this pattern is beginning to stick. In, collect, in connection to Isaac, who is Abraham's direct seed and heir of the promise, God also communicated with Rebekah through an inquiry in Genesis chapter in Genesis chapter 25, verse number 23. You see the connections now? Now let's turn to Genesis 28 and let's read verses 10 to 15. Genesis chapter 28. Verses 10 up to verse 15. It says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. This is the time when he was fleeing from his brother Esau. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Sleeping, we see in verse 12, it says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Verse 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest to to thee I will give it, and to thy seed. Now we see that Jacob got the word of God directly communicated in a dream. Now by this time you would realize that God occurring in a dream, God communicating in a dream occurred already twice. And remember, Jacob was Joseph's father. Now, we would see more times that God communicated to Jacob as he testified also with another dream, said Genesis chapter 31, verse 11 to 13, and with the theophany with the man that wrestled with him in Genesis 32, verse 24 to 30. And the Lord also communicated to Jacob directly in visions in Genesis 46, verses 1 to 4. Now, in relation to Jacob, we see in Genesis 31, verse 24, that God also communicated in a dream with someone else. Let's read Genesis chapter 31 and let's see verse number 24. Genesis 31 verse number 24. And it says, And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream. Now Laban is not, is not a direct line of Abraham nor Isaac, but an uncle of Jacob. But in connection with Jacob, God communicated his will to Laban the Syrian. So God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. So what's the picture? God communicated to Laban directly in a dream. Now you see the pattern? God communicating to other people in connection with Abraham's seed. Now let's continue reading. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 37, verse number 5. Now that's our passage where we read, And Joseph dreamed the dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now we would see some peculiar change right here. Because Joseph dreamed the dream, and he received God's communication of his word, his will, but it's indirect. Notice how God appeared in a dream to Abimelech, to Jacob, and even to Laban. God appeared in a dream and talked to them. 
But this time, Joseph didn't receive the word of the Lord, but simply dreamed a dream. Now, in relation to God communicating his will to Joseph, as in what he's about to do, and in connection with other people not connected to Abraham, but simply because of Abraham's seed, we would see the dreams of the chief baker and the chief butler in Genesis 40, and the dream of Pharaoh in Genesis 41. You see the connections? God deals with other peoples through the seed of Abraham. Now, you won't be surprised that the king Nebuchadnezzar much, much, much later on would still receive the word of God in connection with Abraham's seed. And you're right, that would be Daniel. And the next, uh, next weeks, we're going to focus on the two dreams of the chief butler and the baker, as well as Pharaoh's in Genesis 41. That would be the subject of our future, uh, for the future studies in the next two weeks. Now, we're in our passage in Genesis chapter 37, and let's expound it, okay? Let's start reading from verses 5 to 7. Genesis chapter 30, 37, verses 5 to 7 says this, And Joseph dreamed the dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Now, that's a general overview of what's going to happen. Then verse 6 says, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. There's an overview. Now, there's the detailed details of what's going to be revealed. It says in verse 7, here's the details. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. Now, we have... To understand, we have to see that as, as Joseph's dream unfolds in detail, he's now relaying it to a specific audience. Joseph was talking, he's talking to his brother, brothers, sorry, and he's talking about the sheaves of his brothers making obeisance or bowing down, later on it will be seen by our passage that that word obeyance is to bow. Bowing down to his sheaf, so that's what's being talked about. That's what's being talked about. Now we have to understand at this time that God communicating in a dream is not surprising for Israel's family. Jacob experienced it. Laban experienced it. And someone like Abimelech did. God communicated his will, his word, and his way in a dream. But the only difference is, in Joseph's time, the communication was indirect. So it begs us to ask the question, what does the dream mean? Now, we have to see that the interpretation of the dream is actually prima facie, and amazingly, the brothers understood what the dream meant, and yet in unbelief, they rejected it. Now, how could I say that they understood the dream? Let's see the response in verse number 8, and it says, And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? See? Shall you reign over us? Shall you shall you thou have dominion over us? They understood of the sheaf making obeisance. They understood the dream of Joseph. Yet in unbelief, they said, I just don't like it. I don't want it. I reject it. And so they did. So it says, And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now, my friends, listen carefully. Something that is of the Word of God, when you don't like it, doesn't make it go away. You see, in verse number 9, we read these words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brothers, and told his brothers, and told it his brethren, 
and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. This is the same dream as the sheaf. You see? And then verse 10, it says, it changes its audience, and he told it to his father and to his brethren. Same elements of the dream, the sheaves making obeisance to Joseph's sheaf, the sun, the moon, and the stars making obeisance to Joseph. So, same elements, the same point, make obeisance. He told it to his father, and how did Jacob respond? Jacob said, And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? Now, if I were you, I would take a pen, mark those words. It says, Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed, okay, mark these words, come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? The dream that Joseph dreamt, it's understood. It's understood. But the thing is, they don't like the dream because of unbelief. But here's a caveat. Verse 11 says, And his brethren envied him. That's the response of the brothers. But take a note of this. But his father observed the saying. Now Jacob observed the saying because he himself had been communicated to by God in dreams. Now here's something more to consider. Remember, Remember the dispensational context of our passage. Joseph's story is part of Israel's foundational history, written by Moses, the spokesperson to Israel, to Israel, relaying to them how Israel was formed from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, being that way, did you know that it serves as a precedent to show Israel in the future how God communicates His will through His Word to the nation of Israel. Now, we would see a guide that God tells Moses to tell Israel regarding prophets and those who dream dreams. Now, let's turn to that. Numbers chapter 12, verse number 6. Numbers chapter 12, verse number 6. Now, this is the nation of Israel and they're already formed, and they moved out of the land of Egypt, yet God is solidifying His dealing with that nation. In Numbers chapter 12, verse number 6, this is what God said about prophets and dreamers of dream. It says, And He said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. You see, God is talking to the nation of Israel, defending Moses from the charge of Miriam and Aaron. But we see that God tells the people of Israel how he will speak and how would we make himself known to a prophet? Note the words, in a vision and speak to him in a dream. And I want you to encircle the word among you. A prophet among you. And that among you is not talking with Gentiles, but rather the congregation of Israel. See? God speaks to his people through prophets and sometimes he talks in the prophets dreams now joseph was doing the same for as as a spokesperson this time to jacob and his sons 
And you see the prophet's function that Joseph was fulfilling. Now let's turn to another. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. And let's turn to verses 28 to 29. This is the call and the commission for prophets who are given God's word in a dream. Je Jeremiah chapter 23. And let me turn to verses 28 to 29. Genesis chapter 23 verses 28 to 29, which says this. The prophet that hath a dream, you see that? The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my wheat like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? So you see, God's words is delivered by the prophet by telling the dream that God has given him. That, my friends, is exactly what Joseph did. He dreamt a dream. He knows that it's from God. God is communicating a divine truth in it. So he tells his brethren because he is the spokesperson of God to them at the time. I hope you're seeing the connection. It's there, right? Now, if one to whom God would communicate his word in dreams is a prophet, then do you remember what's the test of a prophet? Whether he has indeed the words of God? Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 21 to verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 21 to 22. Now you would notice that this is how God deals with the nation of Israel. With signs, with wonders. You will see here later on that the Jews require a sign. But we'll talk about that maybe next week or the next next week. But here's the guide for the prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 21 to 22, and this will show whether that prophet indeed has the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 21 to 22 says this, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath n had not spoken? Now that's a good thing. That's the same question we're asking, right? Verse 22, here's God's answer. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, God stopped speaking through Moses, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So what's the test? Whether the prophet indeed has the word of the Lord. One word. Fulfillment of what he says. Let's see if Joseph passes the test. Let's turn to Genesis and let's read verses 41. Genesis uh, 41. Let's see if Joseph passes the test. Verses 42 to 43. Now this is actually fast forward. Bear in mind the key word. The, vision, the dream that Joseph had is that the sheaves, the sun, the moon, and the stars were making obeisance. Joseph said, should we bow down before you? The brother said, should you reign over us? Should you have dominion over us? Mind those words, okay? Now remember that Genesis 41 verse 42 to 43 occurs after all the twists and the turns in Joseph's life. We know the story, right? He was sold as a slave. He was brought to Egypt. He was promoted in Potiphar's house. Yet he was accused falsely by Potiphar's wife and he was thrown to jail. He was forgotten by the butler. But then, Pharaoh had a dream. Joseph interpreted the dream by God's enablement. And this time, Joseph was promoted. After all the twists and the turns, this is what Genesis 41, 42 to 43 says. It says, 
And Pharaoh took off his ring upon his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had and they cried before him. Now mind the words, mark it if you will. It says, bow the knee, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Wow. Wow. Joseph is her heralded by Pharaoh's servants. Bow the knee and he was made ruler over all the land of Egypt. But there's more. Let's turn to Genesis 42, verses 5 to 9. And this would, uh, again, remember that the seven years of plenty that Joseph interpreted for Pharaoh came to pass. A test of a prophet. That's fulfillment again. And now it's beginning of the seven years of famine. And according to Genesis 41, verse 57, all of Egypt, uh, went to Joseph to buy corn, then all the rest of the surrounding countries came to Joseph to buy bread. Because in Genesis 42, verse 5 to 9 says, uh, because in Genesis chapter 41, verse 57, everyone went to Egypt to buy bread from Joseph. Now that news that there's bread in Egypt came to Israel in Canaan. So he sends his sons to buy food in Egypt. Guess who met them there? Let's read Genesis 42 and let's read verses 5 to verse 9. It says, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. Joseph's there. And we read, And Joseph's brethren came. You have your Bibles with you? What happened? He says, it says, Joseph's brethren came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Wow! That's fulfillment of what Joseph was given by God of. And it's fulfilled to the detail. Wow. <laughs> and Joseph saw, verse 7, And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them. And he spake roughly unto them, and he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers didn't know him. Verse 8, And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Now, verse 9 is something that we can encircle, underline, mark, and with letters it says, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land, year come. That, my friends, is clearly and undoubtedly the word of the Lord in a dream through Joseph being fulfilled to the letter. But hold on. There's one more test. One more test. One more test for the prophets of Israel, especially those who dream dreams. Let's turn again to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Gen Deuteronomy chapter 13. And let me read to you verses 1 to verse 3. And the Word of God says this, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, where all we spake unto thee, saying, You see, the prophet presents a dream, it comes to pass. He presents, a, he presents a prophecy. It comes to pass. But here's a test of message. Here's a test of message. Saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and keep his commandments. You see? And keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. The test of message is there. The, it's not enough that the word that the prophet spoke came to pass, but the message the prophet is to point them, point Israel, to God's working, causing Israel to love God and to obey His commandments. So here's a good question. Does Joseph's message in the declaration of his dream and its fulfillment, does it point to God and causes his brethren to love God? Let's find out. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 45, verses 5 to 8. Genesis chapter 45, verses 5 to verse 8. Now this again, remember, we are skipping some of the narrative events. Uh, bear in mind that this passage is after the grand reveal. Jacob's sons, Israel's sons, came back to Egypt a second time with Benjamin this time. There's a plot twist and a series of tests to prove the brother's faith. And this is the time when Joseph revealed, revealed himself as Joseph, his, their brethren, their brother. Now, here's the message that the dreams of Joseph fulfilled is actually declaring. Genesis chapter 45, and let me read verses 5 to verse 8 that says, now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. Now mark these words. For God did send me before you to preserve life. It points to God. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, verse 8, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord over of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You see, that's the message. That's the dream. Those are the sheaves of the brethren bowing down. That's the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to Joseph, making obeisance to him. All of this is God sending him before them to preserve a life. And it seems the brothers are slow to believe that Joseph is not planning any revenge on them. Because we read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Let's turn again to that. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 to 20. That would be the last chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 50, and let's read verses 19 to verse 20. Now, bear in mind this time, bear in mind this time, that this is after Jacob, their father's death. They're thinking that since our father is dead, Joseph will begin his revenge. So they went, the brothers went to Joseph and pled his forgiveness, asking him to forgive them this trespass. Listen to what Joseph said. Verse 19 to verse 20 says, And Joseph saith, said unto them, Fear not, for, I, for am I in the place of God? Joseph said previously that it was not them that sent Joseph there, but it was God in order to preserve the line of Jacob, of Isaac, and Abraham. Because that's part of God's covenant promises to Abraham. Verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. And wow, they really plotted evil against Joseph. 
Remember when they saw Joseph coming in Dothan? They said, see the dreamer. Behold the dreamer. Let's put him in the ditch. And let's see what his dreams would become. They sold him to slavery. And what evil intent they had. But Joseph says, you meant evil against me. Ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. You see the point of the dream? The effect for the brothers, my friends, and to Israel in general, is that they would see the providence and the preservation of God according to the covenant promises of the Lord God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That truth should have been sufficient for them to follow God and his spokesperson to them, Moses, going out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, amidst twists and turns, and into the promised land. That's the point of the prophecy that, that Joseph re got revealed to by God in his dream. So indeed, Joseph functioned as a prophet of the Lord who declared to Israel God's word his will, and his way. Because here's a biblical truth. God communicates his word in various ways in times past. Now, that's an important note to write. God communicates his word in many ways in times past. Now let's look at the dispensational correlation. Let's turn to the New Testament, and let's read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1, and let me read to you verses 1 and verse 2. Now, this would see how God's dealing progresses from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob throughout the nation of Israel and throughout the dispensations. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in, now mind the word, in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. In times past, God spoke in sundry times and in diverse manners. Remember our walkthrough in the book of Genesis where God communicated directly in dreams, in visions, in theophanies? You see that? Diverse manners, sundry times. In times past, unto the fathers by the prophets. Now here's an important truth. Verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now mark the words last days, because following the dispensational setting of the book of Hebrews, it would pertain in one way to the last days of Israel, where God had spoken to his people. You have to remember that the us here in verse 2, in these last days has spoken unto us, us, those word us, would not include Gentiles because the Hebrews, because as the name suggests, is the epistle to the Hebrews and they are written to Hebrews and not us Gentiles. You see? And God has spoken to Israel in these last days. It says in verse 2, spoken unto us by his Son, and that Son is Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. God has spoken to Israel by his Son, Jesus Christ. Now remember, the first time that this happened, in the first advent, the Lord Jesus 
was presented to Israel in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Messiah, the Son of God, the rightful King of Israel, and all the signs and wonders of, Je of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the first part of Acts are all intended to point to Jesus as the Christ. That actually is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Because the king is there in their midst. Israel should have believed and received their Christ. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 2 and we'll see how God had spoken to his people Israel by his son as heralded by his apostles. Acts chapter 2. And let me read to you verses 22 to 23. And mind the words, okay? Verse 22 says, Ye men of Israel. If you're ever wondering who Peter was talking to in Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost, it's very clear here. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, and ye yourselves also know. You, so you see, you see, the point of the signs and the wonders, the miracles, and everything that happened in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it has only one intent. It is to show that Jesus is the Christ. But did Israel believe? Verse 23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That part sounds good. Everything that happened, the presentation of Jesus as the Christ with signs and wonders, miracles approved of God, showing the approval of God. It's all part of God's predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge. It's like God had spoken to us and to us in these last days by His Son. You see? But how did Israel respond? We continue reading and it says, Ye, that's referring to Israel, ye, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. God spoke to Israel by His Son. He approved the Son with signs and wonders and miracles, Israel takes the Son, crucifies Him. Verse 24, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that He should be holden of it. Now let's move on to Acts chapter 2, verse number 36, to see the conclusion of Peter's preaching in Pentecost. And we would see, verse 36, he says, Verse 36, therefore, and here's the word again, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, what's the point? The miracles, the signs, the wonders, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for Israel. It says that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That, my friends, is the declaration of Peter. It doesn't declare that the death of Christ was for their sins. The death of Christ was because of Israel's sin of rejecting their Messiah. It's different. Look at your Bibles. Because it's clearly written there. The death of Christ by Israel's hand is a Proof of their rejection and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the proof that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This is the gospel of the kingdom and it presents who Jesus is to Israel being the Christ. So when the, when the Messiah is now presented to Israel that Jesus is the Christ, what's the rational response? Don't let your doctrine, don't let your tradition answer that for you. But let's look at verse 37 because the rational response would be the response of the audience in verse 37 that says, 
Now when they heard this, now who are this today? This would be the house of Israel. These are the men of Israel. These are the audience of Peter. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, mark your Bibles, it says, What shall we do? What shall we do, he says? Behold the Christ you crucified, Peter says to Israel. How is Israel to respond? Don't let tradition blind you. Don't let your cognition be dissonant in seeing what the scripture says. Because Israel rejected their Christ. They crucified their Christ. And when God raised him from the dead, making him Lord and Christ, they said, what shall we do? What did Peter say? Did Peter say, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is that what Peter said? Acts chapter 2 verse number 38 says it very clearly. And I hope you will not let your tradition, your man-made teaching obscure your view. Because verse 38 says, and this is how Peter answered. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent. And that's not simply a change of mind. That is to turn from their sins. Why? They killed their Christ. That's the logical response. What shall we do? Peter says, repent. Repent. And be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Our works. That is clearly different from our dispensation, right? That's clearly different. If you would say, nah, no, 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 this means you repent and then later on because you've already believed you can be baptized, you are twisting the scriptures from what is saying. From what is saying. See carefully. This is a different time with different spokespersons. And this is talking to Israel. There's no Gentiles here. Maybe you said, oh, the nations, because they're from the nations, they're Gentiles. No, those are Jews that are scattered and were in the nations coming back to Israel to observe a Jewish feast. Clearly different. Clearly different, right? But did you know that the same Hebrews 1-2 that says, in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, in this dispensation of grace, God has also spoken to us by his Son, because did you know that the gospel of the kingdom preached by the apostles to Israel shares the same foundation as the gospel of the grace of God preached by the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles? It has the same foundation. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, the apostle Paul clearly said, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. In the dispensation of the law, in the gospel of the kingdom, it presents who Jesus is being the Christ. But how about the gospel of the grace of God? Let's see for ourselves. And again, my prayer for you is don't let your tradition obscure what the scripture clearly says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, and please Consider what we say. The Lord give you understanding to hear these words. Let's read. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. That can't be clearer than that. You can say that this is not a gospel passage. This is the gospel which says, which I, that would be the Apostle Paul, preached unto you, which also ye have received and were in ye stand. Apostle Paul is preaching this gospel. And verse 2 is very important. Don't unsee this. It says, By which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. This, my friends, 
is the gospel that saves in this dispensation today. The gospel that the apostle Paul preached, the gospel which the Corinthians received, the gospel which the church, the body of Christ received, by which also ye are saved. What's this gospel? Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ shared foundation, right? In the gospel of the kingdom, it presents who Jesus is being the Christ. In the gospel of the grace of God, this is Jesus Christ, but there's more. It presents who Jesus is, and it says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel of the grace of God declares not only who Jesus is being the Christ, but also what he hath done. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says that Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. That, my friends, is the finished work of Jesus Christ. The gospel that saves in this dispensation of grace. Hence, the reasonable response and contrast between the gospel of the kingdom that only presents who Jesus is so that the people must do something to be saved. Don't talk to me. That's not my words. That's Peter's words in Acts chapter 2. But in the gospel of the grace of God, it's the work of Jesus Christ. He is the Christ and this Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again. So much so that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it simply says, In whom ye also trusted. Peter's time, repent and be baptized. Paul's time, in him ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also ye, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. No works in our part anymore because Christ, my friends, has already done the work. And because it was Christ's work, we read also in Galatians 2.16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now that's something. I hope you heard that. We are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. It's Christ's finished work. It's Christ's faith that justifies. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My friends, we, in this dispensation of grace, are saved eternally and justified absolutely by the faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as the apostles were spokespersons to Israel through whom God communicates His word then in times past, we see that we Gentiles, we are also given a spokesperson. The apostle Paul, through whom God communicates his word now in this dispensation of grace. Now, this is how God communicates his word then and now. Now, we have to bear that in mind. Now, in our time today, we read that the Apostle Paul declared in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All scripture 
is given by inspiration of God. And we are also instructed in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, by our apostle, to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, to rightly divide the word of truth is to see, as we have pointed out tonight, what parts of scriptures are written for us and for our doctrine and to us for our instruction and what is written for a different audience in a different time by a different spokesperson that is for our learning. Now, therefore, for the spokespersons that pertain to a different dispensation than our dispensation, should we not study them anymore? Now, let me turn your attention to Romans chapter 15, for this is what our Apostle Paul instructs. God communicates His Word in different times, both then and now. For the then times, this is our Apostle Paul's instruction. Romans chapter 15, verse number 4, it says, Romans 15, verse number 4, says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. So, those that are written not in our dispensation, that's not our doctrine, but we can absolutely learn from it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul even wrote that these things were written as in samples for us. You see? It's for our learning. But how about those that are written by our spokesperson? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 37. And I want us to really pay attention to what the Apostle Paul says. And it says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, Okay, you consider yourself a prophet, you consider yourself spiritual, let him, our Apostle Paul says, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are what? Mark your Bibles. It says, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You see? Know first of all, know this first of all, that Apostle Paul's admonitions, exhortations, comfort, instructions, these are the commandments of the Lord for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. And first of all, know the only gospel that saves in this dispensation of grace today, and that's the gospel that is preached by our Apostle Paul that declares the death of Christ for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection for our justification. That's where it begins. If anyone is spiritual, let him, let him consider, let him that is spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. I pray that you would see that God in times past had spoken in different ways, in, var in sundry times, He spoke in His Son, but it's times past. But now, He spoke to us by His Son as revealed, preached by our Apostle Paul, starting with the gospel that He preached in which we are established in which the secrets of men shall be judged in the end. My prayer for you tonight is that you would consider what we say and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we can hear. And I pray, Father God, that we would see your word for us today declared by your Apostle Paul declared to us that we may know, number one, how to be saved by the gospel that he preached and know how we ought to live and please God by the instructions that he gave. Pray, Father God, for the, for the, for the people that are listening, that they would hear you, 
that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would enlighten them unto all truth. Pray that these things will simply burn in their hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you in, other, in our future broadcasts on Monday. We pray that we can uh, broadcast another session of the precepts from the Proverbs. And next Saturday, we hope to see you again sa Comfort Verses as we look at the dispensational truths from the life of Joseph and we'll see how we understand God's words then and now. On Thursdays, we have the online Bible study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So thank you very much for listening, my friends. The Lord bless you.